All right, everybody, let's talk about these things called Bende dots. Now, Bende dots, uh, if you're familiar with the work of Roy Lichtenstein here, you'll know what Bende dots are. You'll have noticed that in his work, uh, they, they consist of all these little dots on his, on his work. So when we have a look at um, what Bende dots actually are, we find out that they're actually named after a person and they're actually from the world of graphic design and commercial art. So I've got a Wikipedia page here. Um, which is really quite handy if you just want sort of basic um, knowledge on on stuff. And we find out here that the the Bende process, named after the illustrator uh, and printer Ben Harry Day Jr. Um, he was the son of publisher Ben Harry Henry Day. Um, it's a printing and photo engraving technique. It says here, um, dating from 1879. But uh, the, the process now is commonly described as Bende dots. Now, it comes from a time where graphic designers, that was, an, it was a job that, you know, a whole lot of processes they did that only really graphic designers with the right equipment could do. Uh, these days, you can create these things in Photoshop. But back in the day, it was quite a, a, quite a process to photographically um, produce these dots and convert black and white and colored photos into these Bende dots. And so they're designed as a way of uh, printing something quite simply. So uh, we really, if we're going to get into the Bende dots and look at them, um, we really need to uh, understand, firstly, their commercial, their commercial application, which was to, as you can see here, um, to render a photograph into a series of dots that were large and small, and so they could um, be easily printed. Now, you have to remember that the the dots, these ones are actually in negative, which is interesting. But anyway, let's get into Lichtenstein because he's the he's the he's the kind of artist that made Bende dots famous and brought the world of the the newspaper and the um, comic strip into the art gallery. Well, I'm just going to crack through these pretty quick because we know these artworks very well. This is Lichtenstein's Wham, done in 1963. It's a, a a topical work about he was a pop artist from the 60s okay so pop art brought um everyday objects and everyday life and you know the world of the supermarket um the world of the comic strip the world of the commercial art world into high art galleries and put it on the wall of you know um Art, art, the art galleries of the time and 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 these people became fine artists and so this is wham done in 1963 very famous famous um, artwork you can go and look this up and find out all the things that go all the reasoning behind it and all the sort of possible meanings of it but i, I just think it's what's so exciting about Liechtenstein is if you put yourself back in the in the 1960s and you walked in an art gallery and you saw this thing on the wall it's about two and a half three meters wide and a meter and a half high it's quite large and the impact that this would have had, it just would have been, it just would have been so far out there, and 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 quite, it would have had, would have made a real impact on on a big white gallery wall. And you know, it, it's a comic book image blown up huge, and painted by hand, by the way, a lot of it. So uh, he had assistants that helped him, but um, anyway, this is one of the one of the works that you know. Is he's probably most famous for the other one is as I open fire. It's kind of almost um, is a partner to the first one, Wham, and it has that sort of three stage. Um, you know how comic strips uh, tell the story. I guess if you, I remember as a kid, I used to I used to be obsessed with those war comics, and they and they do this kind of frame by frame by frame uh, photo story or image story. Anyway, keep going on. Uh, Drowning girl. Uh, the other thing that um, Interestingly, I will get into a little bit of theme. Um, Liechtenstein plays with the idea of American um, domination, world domination, which was going on in the Cold War, and and this sort of military masculine violence and masculine power. And then at the same time, which you get in in American comics of the fifties and sixties. Let's not forget that you know Captain America. That's his name. Um, he's he's a he's a hero. Um, uh, Superman. I mean, he he wears red, white, and blue. Um, need I say any more? Uh, and then we've got here at the same time Superman. For every soup, like for every male um, 
hero, there's a female damsel in distress. And we obviously, the obvious one for Superman is Lois Lane. So Roy Lichtenstein also picked up on the on the theme in these comics at the time of this sort of masculine culture and the and and the damsel in distress, the, the helpless woman, the woman who needs help, the, the woman you know who's 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 basically needing needing to be saved. And so this is his um, famous um drowning girl of 1963 where he's playing around with and looking at and asking questions about how women are portrayed at the time in 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 these comic books um and the other one is uh in the car and and here we've got this i hope you can see my mouse this this sort of powerful angry he's almost got a manipulative look in his face um in his eyes and she's quite indifferent and um a little bit distressed and looks a little upset um, and we've got these sort of whizzing speed lines that you get in comics. Um, yeah, they're fantastic. And if, if we just jump forward and we just have a look at comics of the time, these are the comics of the time. These are actually real comics. Here's a Superman, um, some kind of robotic Superman. And and with with this sort of Bende dot printing process, you'll see they're kind of slightly off. Like they're a bit skewed. They're out of out of alignment. And and you know, printing you pay you have to pay per color. So uh, there would have been one screen for all this blue and one screen for all the red and one screen for the yellow and then the black overlay. Um, and again, you see these strong jawed males. Um, and then you see there's a lot of this misogynist stuff in the old comics as well. You know, you've got this um, strong, masculine, powerful male and, and you know, this kind of sexist behaviour that, that goes on. Anyway, um you know, we, you can go and explore all that sort of stuff if, when you look at these. These these are not Liechtenstein works. These are actual comics at the time that Liechtenstein then parodied. So they, they're quite interesting to, to know the context, I guess. Um, okay, one of the um, things that I really love about Liechtenstein is when he did some appropriations where he, where he took another artist's work and um, re, rehashed it to make it his own. Very postmodern thing to do. Um, he's just on the border of postmodern here, modernism here in the late 60s. Sort of mod, postmodernism really comes into the fore in the mid 70s. But uh, here he is, um, and and the irony in this is that he's made a series of works based on Monet's uh, Rouen Cathedral. Monet did hundreds of these paintings of the Rouen Cathedral. He also painted in series. So the irony here, or the joke of it is, or the, not the joke of it, but the the, the uh, the irony of it is that, is that Liechtenstein is making a series of works based on a, 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 an artist who did a series of works, basically. Um, and this is number three, says here set three. So there's set four, set five, set six, goes on and on and on. Um, so this is just a few of them. He did quite a, he did quite a few. Uh, and then he did the same with the Haystacks, Monet's famous Haystack series again. And we hear, see here that Liechtenstein's, um, this is Haystack 7. So obviously we would assume, and I've actually seen blue ones and red ones of these, and there's 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 quite a, there's a series of these things. Again, the irony being it's a series of work about a series of work. Um, and then he goes on and he appropriate he appropriated quite a few um, sort of early to mid twentieth century artists. This is um, Carlo Carra, is an Italian futurist painter, which is Il Cavallero Rosso, which I think loosely translates as the Red Horseman. And this is Liechtenstein's version of it in 1975, again, doing these Bende dots. Um, this is one of the few times, if, oh, no, I can't do it. Yes, I can, that he's done these, he's actually done the uh, gradation of dots. Um, he doesn't normally, he didn't normally do that, Liechtenstein. Uh, I love this work. This is a uh, woman with the flowered hat done in 1963, which is an appropriation of Dora Ma El Chats by Picasso in 1941. Excuse me. Australian accent as I um, try and pronounce these <laughs> Spanish and French names of artworks. Um, and then uh, Van Gogh's Bedroom at Arles, obviously, is, uh, is pretty well known Liechtenstein work um, where he's appropriated. And interestingly, he's updated the chairs to these um, groovy 1960s chairs. And some chair expert will tell me the name of those chairs, but I can't remember the name of these chairs. So the life of me, chuck it in the comments. Um, and he's neatened up his clothes. <laughs> He's neaten up his clothing. And uh, if we know anything about Liechtenstein's still life works, um, you'll know that there is, um, he does later on look at still life with these Bende dots in them. And also, curiously, this little uh, towel here has been very tight, very much tidy. So everything's sharpened up and neatened up and, and sort of made to look a bit contemporary. But I love the, I love the addition of the, 
of the contemporary chairs. I think they're Bauhaus chairs or something. I don't know. Um, I love these. These are Lichtenstein's play on the idea that an artwork is an original thing done with um, the authentic brushstroke of the artist. So here's Lichtenstein's uh, mass-produced um, copies of authentic brushstrokes. <laughs> I think it's a great idea. Um, the Bende dots that he's famous for, he just didn't um, – produce it as a flat thing on on canvas as paintings and print um he, he he got into the sculptural and he was able to answer the sculptural question and make sculptures of these works as well uh, ironically these are actually see-through you could poke your hand through those sort of voids there but the dot areas are actually solid so i just think um not many people sort of talk about his sculpture that much and there's so much of it a lot of it was public sculpture too in cities so um anyway getting into uh the still life because this this is actually about helping you nine my year nine class do their still life paintings uh he's what remember with uh lichtenstein here we're not just looking at the bende dots there's also lines and if we go back to the wikipedia page i think it reads um there's company commonly described in terms of dots but other shapes can be used such as parallel lines okay so there it is there it is there such as parallel lines, texture, irregular effects, or wavy lines, uh, which is interesting. So uh, if we go back to the Lichtenstein here, and, um, yeah, we see that he's starting to play around with the lines here uh, and really beautifully rendered this idea of the glass. I love the way you can see the lemon through the glass. Now, still life is a, is a very traditional thing that you do in art school. Still, die, still life is a very traditional theme in art. Um, it goes a long way back. So Lichtenstein is, is um, always playing with traditional themes in art and bringing them up to his own contemporary comic book aesthetic, I guess. Uh, I love the way in this plate there's, there's the red Bende dots and there's also the black ones, which is something to take note of. Uh, his interiors are just, these are such fun works. These are so cool. And, and they're like all these iconic um, modernist um, minimal architecture, uh, furniture and architecture, architectural space, interior decorating the, and the furniture design from the time are, are all in these works. I really mumbled my words then, sorry. Um, as now, the, in this work, this is a good example of where the dots don't obey the shape. See how they're going horizontal to the picture plane and they're not going in line with the perspective of the lounge and they just sort of continue on down through the rug oblivious to the shape they just sort of fill in there and I, that's quite a clever thing and i think that's something that you can play with in your painting if you're appropriating Liechtenstein. uh and this is uh, another still life um i wonder if this little uh windmill at the side is a little homage to dutch artist uh, Van Gogh, I don't know. Um, and then here we have a quite almost a cubist looking um, painting originally. It's sort of you think he's sort of get appropriating. So we used to him appropriating 20th century artists. And we're probably my first instinct when I looked at this was he's appropriating Picasso, but I think he's actually pro appropriating um, a, a Cezanne. Now, Cezanne was a post impressionist painter who pointed to cubism. He said lots of things about lots of ideas about cubism and Picasso looked back to Cezanne and and sort of paid homage to him and borrowed a lot of his ideas or built on his ideas in his own in his own um, journey uh, and experiments with cubism and so here we have um, Liechtenstein appropriating well he's not really appropriating he's kind of paying homage to two artists here Picasso and and Cezanne, and, you know, the, the, the obvious connections between Cezanne and Picasso are not lost, of course. Now, what we have here are all the tools of the artist. So we've got the paint brushes, we've got the paint palette, we've got the palette knife, we've got the uh, mixing vessels, we've got a, <laughs> a set square, these are bottles of paint. Um, so anyway, uh, and often still life has this drapery in the back, and there's a canvas, okay? So he's sort of playing around with ideas of tradition and what it is to be an artist and originality. These are all tools of the original, this, like artists who do that original, authentic um, uh, signature brushstroke art. And uh, Lichtenstein doesn't do signature brushstroke art. He does this mass production comic strip style art. So there's a real irony in, in even the theme of this painting. Uh, remembering that uh, Lichtenstein doesn't always do black outlines. He's most known for his black outlines, but here's a couple of examples where he's used a really dark, almost Prussian blue outline 
and then these this red outline here down with the fruit which i think is a really really these are more sort of recent works they're really quite beautiful um Okay, so what are Bende dots? Well, as I said, they're a, they're a printing technique um, and they really came to the fore in uh, newspaper printing in the mid to late 20th century uh, and they, they're a way of quickly producing a photo. So it was a, quite a, quite a uh, photographic process that they had to go through and get the photographs were reduced to these black dots and um, the, the, the bigger the black dots and then the closer they were together, that was the darker tone. And then the smaller the black dots, the further apart they were, that's the lighter tones. And here's a sort of a tonal gradation. Uh, this is actually in reverse. The dots are actually in the, in well, in that pale brown, in the white. So um, it, it sort of, be, the, proce the process became more and more advanced as time went on. But basically you could out of, you could produce just one, metal plate to then it was lithographic plate i think to then print these photos in newspapers and as i said comic strips at the time each color cost money so uh, there would be for this artwork here of superman for example there would be a blue plate that would have the hair blocked in and these bende dots for the background for the sky so uh you you know if you wanted to do the sky as a pale blue as a solid color you would have to have another plate for that so the dots provide that solution you just put you put you use the same blue ink on the same plate and for the where you want it pale when you want a pale version of that color you just leave the white space between the dots and and it kind of it just appears pale blue just by its sort of optical nature so uh this this one would have had a red plate a yellow plate and a blue plate and then a black plate that's it four plates so um as i said uh, each color is money time is money to produce it um, and they, they mass produce mass printing um, in a printing factory. You can see a lot often, I remember as a kid looking at color comics, I used to always jump to the comic section section in the newspaper on a Sunday and the comics uh, often they'd be printed slightly out of whack or out of registration as they say. So you can see that here. Um, you can see the yellow is not quite right and the yellow is off here and the dots are off here. And look at the yellow, it's sort of about two millimeters to the left too far. But anyway, um, all right, what are Bende dots? Well, let's look at what they're not. They are not, as indicated by this red cross, straight above each other like this and in line. They are indeed offset left and right in almost a diagonal sense. So if you're going to play around with Lichtenstein and copying his technique, you've got to remember that the Bende dots sit diagonally off each other like that. Now, it was a machine process and it was a photographic process and it involved a, going through a bunch of photographic labs and, and special cameras, um, which would then produce these uh, metal plates that had the image etched into them in dot form. Um, we don't have access to any of that equipment. It was, it was quite a long process uh, and there would have been a lot of people working on it um, in these uh, newspapers where, you know, things were printed overnight stories came in um, and they would have got things down to the photo lab and printed them very quickly. Lichtenstein, uh, he had assistants as well. He had people helping him. Um, when you go onto YouTube and look up Lichtenstein painting in his studio, you will see that he's got two or three assistants who um, are, are peeling off. He, well, Lichtenstein didn't do the photographic process. He used, he used um, stenciling. So he would use these uh, big sheets of sticky um, plastic sheeting, I guess, like contact with these dots cut into them and then they they paint over them. Or um, they use a lot of masking tape as well to do the lines. So anyway, we don't have that. So how are we going to solve this problem painting in year nine in the, in the classroom? How are we going to try and replicate these dot images um, in our painting? So uh, let's jump in. I've got a few solutions. I've looked up so much stuff on, on YouTube and haven't really found anything particularly successful. My solutions are, I think, moderately successful. Um, you really can't beat the, the, the actual process, but we, we don't have access to all of that. But if with a bit of patience and a bit of time and, and a bit of um, sort of careful planning and practice, I think you can get pretty close. So let's jump in and have a look. Well, I've noticed that um, some of you who are doing uh, Roy Lichtenstein, who I've got here on this uh, screen, are really struggling with his Bende dots, which are the dots that he used uh, in all his paintings. So let's get straight to how you might uh, go about doing those dots. 
So these are the dots we're talking about. So let's get to it. How do we do it? All right. Well, I've got a bunch of things here. I've got some paint, uh, some water. I've got some sponge. Uh, we're going to try some few different techniques and see which ones work better. I've got cotton buds, which are really useful. I've got a paintbrush that I've sawn off with a uh, tack saw, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, I've got some bubble wrap, and I've even got a glue stick uh, insert. So uh, let's go. So I've got this um, canvas here uh, that I put some I put some apples. I've just done some simple apples on. Okay. And I've, I've pretty much tried to draw the apple to a more, I mean, I've done it pretty quickly, so, you know, I've drawn it a few times. So let's just go with the first technique. Let's do some stripes. Now, the first thing you've got to understand is, do, with Liechtenstein, probably a good idea to do the dots first and then do the outline later. Put this masking tape out. I used a metal ruler and I cut some strips, as you can see here. Now, I wasn't the best at cutting them, so when that sort of thing happens, just chuck it away. If you've cut enough of them, you should have plenty of them. So, and what I did was I sliced this way, so I sliced the stripes that way, and I also sliced across, because, um, you know, my, my artwork is not very big, the one I'm going to show you. But what you'll notice is that Liechtenstein does these stripes at an angle. You stick them down the same thickness apart. Now try and cut them as neat as you can. Some of mine are a bit thicker than others, and that's not real great. So you've got to try and fix those kind of things up. I've got, they've all become different thicknesses I've noticed because I couldn't see while I was doing it. So I'm going to just quickly cut this one again. Now when you cut, they tend to go off at an angle. So try and push the knife into the blade as you go, like, that. When you look up Liechtenstein on YouTube, there's lots of really great footage of him um, doing his work, which is really helpful. And I mean, you know, as he got older and more successful, he he, he had assistance in his studio. So, you know, we can't we can't replicate that. In the early days, he did it all himself, but he was a graphic designer. And in those days, a graphic designer was, you know, it was, it was a profession. These days, everyone's a graphic designer with Photoshop, but back then it was something that, was, that you had to know. It was a skilled job. Now, you could put tape around this part, but I'm pretty careful with my painting, so I'm just going to plot on the way, the way, I'd, the way I would normally do it, just painting carefully. A lot of Liechtenstein, Liechtenstein stripes are in, are in black. Now, you can use a round brush or a flat brush I'm, I'm I'm tempted to use the flat brush I just think it'll work better so adding a bit of water to the paint I'll just put the water over there and I'm, I haven't got anything else on this little palette it's just a ice cream container lid I'm I'm going to just add a touch of water there are no other outer, uh, no other colors on this palette okay and I just quickly um, ran my fingernail along the edge of the masking tape. Now this doesn't mean you just hold this bolus, start painting like mad over the, I've got something there. Ah, i got water there. That's not good. You don't just hold this bolus, start just painting across it. You take your time and paint carefully. A little bit of uh, water with my paint just to make it nice and fluid. While it's wet, we take the masking tape up. We take it up very slowly and carefully. Now, if you don't stick your masking tape down enough, you're going to get a bleed, which you're noticing here. Now that's okay, because what you're then going to have to do is paint back over it and tidy it up but it gets you off to a good start. Leaning on your little finger or leaning on your hand, I would just carefully clean these up. And you see Liechtenstein doing that too in his, in his um, videos. Now, you'll notice that I'm just painting the edge of the stripes that are 
away from me. That's because you get a sharp edge with this end of the brush. It is a slow and careful job. I'm going to actually put that in a bit of an angle. Now, to do these outline, to do these, these lines, these kind of brushes aren't that great. That's where one of these rounder brushes work better. And the trick is, and the trick is to have lots and lots and lots of paint on the end of your brush, and have it nice and fluid. So I'm going to use a little bit of water. And this is rolling the paint off the back because we don't want paint on the metal part of the brush. We want the paint on the tip. Take your time, go slow, and here's what we do. I use the brush in an upright way. Can you see how I'm balancing on my little finger? And turning the brush in my hand. So I actually roll the brush as I go around these corners. You'll also notice that I stop talking when I paint like this. Now painting like this in this style, I've got to be honest, is not my forte. And there's all little battles that go on. Right now, there's a little hair on the end of my brush that's driving me crazy. But anyway, Hopefully, there's the result. Okay, so that's that should get you started on his stripes. When it comes to the dots, one of the things that you've got to think about is this is them as tone, right? So if we um, look at one of his pictures, you'll notice there'll be like a patch of dots just there and a patch of dots down the side. So you can see I've drawn a an outline there and an outline there. Now I don't want to do it too dark because if I do it too, too dark it's going to be a real hassle later on to get rid of it because we actually don't want those we don't want those pencil lines there and we're not going to outline the edge of that tone. Now remember I said do the dots first then do the black outline. So when you do the dots mark out and I'm just going to use the centimeter I'm going to use half centimeter actually now remember, when when the dots happen, there there there's like a row of dots like this, and then the next ones are diagonally opposite them. They're not in rows. They're like you could put crosses. You could do this across the dots. You might have to practice this on paper first. That's what I would definitely do. And I'm actually not completely following the ruler. I'm just using the ruler mostly to get things in line. All right, so there we have it. I've done all the dots in pencil very lightly. I use the ruler just to get them all in a line. One thing um, which is good to do is cut yourself a stencil, okay? So I'm going to cut myself of this shape. It's a bit tricky to see, but I think I've got the general shape of it. And I'm gonna put a few guidelines around there to just get that right. But very carefully cutting out. And, and the other thing is, if you don't have a tidy stencil, you won't have a tidy painting. And Lichtenstein, if we're going to try and work in his technique, then we have to get our heads around, is being super neat and super tidy. And also being really careful with the sharp knife. Putting the cap back on this, because it's super sharp, we don't need it. 
I'm actually going to use these as well because these are a useful thing. We'll do the reverse. So there's my stencil and there's my stencil. Now a few techniques I've seen on the internet. First one is um, using bubble wrap. I don't like this technique. I'll show you what it looks like. I got my sponge. I got a little bit of water on my sponge. I pick up some paint like this, like that. I dab it on the bubble wrap. And then we put it on the painting. Um, I'll just do a little section on the, on the apple. And we put it on the painting like this. We press it down and then we lift it up and I'll just take that away. Look, it's not bad, but it's not great. It's hard to control. See the white spots, varying degrees of uh, opacity, opaqueness. You know, you've got all these gaps and things in it. I don't like the bubble wrap technique. I, it looks a bit amateur it looks like you did it with bubble wrap which is what you did it'd be good if you could challenge yourself to try something a little bit more sophisticated so the other way is of course patiently hand paint them using lots of water with your brush hand paint them and i've seen students do this really successfully the discipline in it is to stay focused not get lazy with them not start going that'll do that'll do that'll do because they start to get this they start to get an odd shape you'll notice my first ones are a lot better than my other one you start to get that and you start to get this what we this see this uh, furry edge around them not, not very good. Next technique, which is a pretty good one actually, this next one. And that is to use a cotton bud. So we take a cotton bud, we put it into the paint, and very carefully dot with it. Now be very aware that as your cotton bud starts to run out of paint, it's pretty good actually, it starts to get a furry edge about it, but it's, I reckon it's pretty good. This is where I would use my stencil. Ah, and I just smudged it. Okay, so here's an issue with stencils, right? This is the discipline of using a stencil. You can smudge it while it's wet. So, which I just did on this one, but doesn't matter. We'll just keep going. Okay, so all of this stuff requires, and I'm trying to like move along pretty quick, but all of this stuff requires you, I just wet the tip of my cotton bud too, to be consistently um, calm and patient. Now, I've just written this one off. See, as soon as it gets these little ends on it, Get rid of it, get a fresh one. I'm sure there's no shortage of cotton buds. They come in packs of 200. All right, holding my stencil down because Liechtenstein's Bende dots have, they, they're used tonally. And you'll notice also, I am not following my original grid. Sometimes I land on it. And sometimes I don't. Take your time. If you're not satisfied with a dot, do the dot again. It's not that hard. Very carefully lift it. That's not a bad result at all. Besides my smudgy bit. I think that... Let's just bring it up here. Closer to the camera. That's a good result. So that's worked out really well. And that's just using a cotton bud. Now I'm sure you can do a much neater job than me. Take your time. 
cut your stencil carefully. All right, so this stencil, look how big it is. I was doing it in a hurry. Um, oh, and also, there is paint on the other side of this stencil now, so just let it dry. Just hit it with a hairdryer or something, and then go again, okay? Now, the last technique, and it's not a bad one too. Uh, I hope I can buff on a bit. I got this uh, paintbrush. You can use a pencil, and I cut it with a hacksaw. I just cut to the right roundness. Now you can use a pencil as well, but the problem with the pencil is a lot of pencils are hexagonal. So that's no good. You'll end up with hexagonal dots. And so what I do then with the um, with the paintbrush or the pencil is I then, I gotta get that little burr off the edge there. So just lightly sand it and make sure you don't go like this. You want a nice flat edge. If you start curving it because you're sanding like that, you'll end up it won't be any good. The sandpaper will give it a little bit of a brushiness about it, like a little bit of fur. Now, when I sand it, I don't sand it like that. I put my finger right on the sandpaper and I get it just right. Okay, I'll show you what these dots look like. I'm thinking I might have to wet this a touch. I just dampened it and dried it on my jeans. Now these ones, you'll have to dot each time. Now this is if you've got to do bigger dots. Now these dots you might have to go back over and touch up with a brush. Ah, that wasn't great was it? You can try redoing the dot, it's a bit scary. Now this is where you'd use your stencil on the edge. And wherever it overlaps the stencil, that's a cool look. Because that's kind of authentic looking. Oh, come on. You've worked, you'll get a good technique going, which I haven't got yet. Okay, the important bit is I want to get these side bits and show them to you. You'll get a, you'll get a feel for it, like, you know, what's the happiest kind of combination of pressure and um, pressure and uh, how much paint and how many times you can, what's your mileage, you know, how many, how many times you can stamp down. You'll notice I just used a um, cotton bud to the rescue as well. Anyway, here we go, one more. Two more actually. Let's peel this off and see how that looked. That's probably not half bad as well. Okay, bit close together. That's the other thing. You know, like they really are not that close together. When you look at them, they're actually not that close together. They're actually probably further apart and the larger the dots the larger the gap that's better they're way too close and these ones are more like it now when you use this kind of technique you need a fair amount of paint on it See that? See I'm stretching the paper stencil out? Whoops, a bit, a bit too much paint. You really are going to have to practice. See how carefully I lift it up? That's better. That's better, isn't it? Do you think? Let me have a look. Got the bubble wrap, the hand brushing, the cotton bud for the smaller ones and the cut pencil or brush this thing where is it gone this thing for these and further apart is better than closer together see that further apart is heat's heat's better and then uh, i guess 
Shall we try some black around the edge? When they're dry, be patient. Be really patient with it. When they're dry, you can I guess you can then get your black paint and and do your black line. Up the edge, all right, and you know the usual stuff that goes on in a Liechtenstein. Does that make sense? All right, have a go, be patient, and uh, good luck. So just finally, um, just to finish things off, remember this: the stripes using the masking tape. You've got to cut your masking tape a lot more evenly than what I did. So I did it a little bit quickly. So all of this is all about being patient and taking your time. But these were stripes using masking tape. Okay. Uh, the next one was, I remember the bubble wrap. Not so hot. I don't think it works that well. And they're a bit too close together as well. Uh, and then we hand painted them with a brush. That wasn't so bad, but they get this furry edge on them. I think the cotton bud works really well. When you're got a, when you're doing a miniature kind of Liechtenstein, when you're doing smaller the smaller dots, because you know you got to paint the dots to scale. So when you're doing a smaller thing, but uh, I I think the the better one was probably making up one of these little tools, a little brush, a little well, it's not really a brush, is it? It's a painting stick. But you you can see on on the camera, you can actually see the little like slightly furry edge on it caused by the sandpaper. But it's got to be super clean and. Don't do them too close together. Do them to scale further apart. Much better. Much, much better. Much more successful. Now, this will rub out, these pencil marks, they will rub out carefully with a rubber. The other thing is you can carefully go back in around them and paint in white. That will drive you a bit crazy. But anyway, see how you go.